Now, the book called Malachi, or My Messenger, <clears throat> is a real fitting book for the last book of the Old Testament. It really ends with the people expecting what the third and fourth chapter promise is going to come. There's going to be a messenger, and he, he's named Elijah. And so, that's their, so they're expecting this, and they always were, and it's the last message God had until John the Baptist, who was that messenger. Complete silence until the predicted messenger actually comes. Uh, the amount of time that was, I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, I do know that when I think of the uh, order and dates of the Bible books in the Old Testament, I try to keep them in chronological order. Uh, the dates aren't too relevant, but key times are. The destruction of the temple, for example, the rebuilding of the temple, the captivity of the northern tribes in Israel, uh, Solomon's dedication of the temple. All these things are, are time frames or uh, eponymous times when we have to just look at how much time between them. That's what matters. Um, and the prophet Malachi, and I don't believe it's a person's name, that's just my opinion. I have a number of reasons, and if we have enough time at the end of the class, I'll go into that, but uh, it just simply means my messenger. And I think it's suitable that the last book of the Old Testament is anonymous. Ancient rabbis and scholars thought it was Nehemiah. Some thought it was Zechariah. Uh, the book of Zechariah, which precedes this, uh, precedes it by about 95 years. Uh, the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther should be right here, chronologically, between Zechariah and Malachi. And Malachi was probably written during the time of Nehemiah. The reason they're not here and in the historical section is there's no prophecies in them. That's why they're not the prophetic writings. They're just histories. But keep in mind, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther can go right between Zechariah and Malachi. So uh, the idea of, of, of messengers is, uh, is common. Now keep in mind, the word messenger sometimes is translated angel in both the Old and the New Testament. And if the context seems to indicate it's not a human, then it's translated angel. Um, as simple as that. But, the, but it's up to the translator to choose, and it's up to the reader to know that. Um, Josh read a, one of my favorite verses from the last chapter of Chronicles. I'm going to read it again. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by His messengers, rising up early and sending them, because He had compassion on His people and on His dwelling pace. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised His words, and scoffed at His prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against His people, till there was no remedy. You know, when, you, when a people reaches a point where there's no longer a remedy, the day of the Lord's coming for that people. And so the destruction of Jerusalem was not long after that. And now there's another day of the Lord that Malachi is talking about. Joel talked about it in chapter 2. The great and dreadful day of the Lord. And... Um, you know, that's A.D. 70. But a lot of things were going to happen before the nation of Israel went extinct. And a lot of blessings in the, in the coming of Jesus and the Spirit that would flow. So the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by my messenger, or Amalekai. And by the way, the, the title is suitable for the book because the word messenger occurs during this book. Especially in chapter 3, it's of two different personages, and we'll get to that. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? There are ten times in this book where the Lord says something and the people interject almost in an, in an argumentative fashion as if they're going to win the argument with the Lord. But they do. Malachi, the writer here, uh, quotes what they're saying, and... That tells you about the heart of the people at this time. You know, after all they'd been through, the captivity in Babylon, the only thing that really cured was that they no longer served Baal or 
Asherah or Moloch. That it, would, that it did. They never went back to that. But nothing else really changed. Um, in what way do you say you have loved us? Was not Esau Jacob, Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated, and laid waste to his mountains. E Edom, um, or Jacob, here was loved. His brother Esau, uh, his descendants dis uh, settled the south, far southern, eastern part of Palestine, just out of their border limits. They lived in the hills and mountains. They thought that they couldn't be conquered. Uh, so they, so uh, the Lord laid waste to his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Ah, the Lord says, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will throw it down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Uh, your eyes shall see, and you shall say, the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. So again, they were just outside the border of Israel that this judgment on Edom came. Uh, I believe it was Obadiah that carried the prophecy against them. And uh, they were destroyed. And typically, um, you see different types of destruction where they'll return, they'll have a, they'll have a little bit of people left, and the God allows them to come back like Egypt. Egypt eventually was promised that it would be restored and, and uh, blessed. Uh, Edom, no. Esau's descendants, no. Uh, they, were, they were one of the worst enemies of, of Israel. From the day they left Egypt, and uh, they cheered on everybody that was against Israel. So God goes on to say, A son honors his father and a servant is master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name. Now, it gives you a state of the union address here when the priests who are supposed to be the leaders are doing badly. I mean, what did they learn from all the punishment? And yet the priests say, yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? Well, they're going through all the rituals, just, you know, like uh, technically right. But the heart was wrong, and the way they were doing it was just, uh, they were cheaping out on God. I mean, they were just, uh, there was no substance to what they were doing. Their worship was truly in vain. So God says to them, you offer defiled food on my altar, but you say, in what way have we defiled you? by saying the table of the Lord's is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? And you think about it, that's a common thing. People will show great respect to humans, their boss or whoever. But we don't show that much respect to God in, in, in many ways. It, because we can see these people. We, and we have high esteem for them, and maybe we want something from them. But we need God to give us more. We need something from God. And uh, they weren't getting it. They weren't getting it. And God's pointing that out with his questioning. But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us while this is being done by your hands. Will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. It would be better they didn't do it at all than to do it in a vain, hypocritical, offensive way to the Lord. Better not to do it at all. For from the rising of the sun even to the going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered in my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Now this is a common statement and because outside of the borders of Israel uh, it's ironic I'll just go smaller Jerusalem that's where all the prophets were killed Jesus said is it possible that a prophet will not will, be, will die outside of Jerusalem Jerusalem was the dangerous place for a prophet that was dangerous and so inside the borders of Israel in a similar way 
there was less respect for God than the superstitious nations outside them. Remember the story of Jonah. Look how godly those people were willing to be when they met the Lord through Jonah. Israel and the people really um, had a nature about them that was just uh, upsetting. Um, I like what um, Moses said. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Moses, when he was uh, finishing his course in the very near the end of his life, before he wrote a psalm and before he wrote the blessing, which was in the last day of his life, right before that, he said this. This is his last personal message to the people of Israel. For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. If today while I'm yet, yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord, how much more then after my death? I mean, for I know that after my death you will become utterly corrupt and turn aside from the way with which I have commanded you. This is Moses' goodbye to the people. Um, and so uh, they didn't have a good record. And we can see from, and the, and the message is in Ezra and Nehemiah and Malachi, which are contemporary, is very similar. Very similar condemnation of very similar sins. And we'll get to that in a bit. Um, but you profane it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and its fruit, its food, it's contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness that you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering, should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord. Uh, you know, they, they didn't like doing it. You know, they were saying it's, it's kind of boring. It's, it's wearisome to do this. Um, they saw no spiritual side of this at all. These were completely carnal people in their thinking. But cursed be the deceiver who has his flock a male and makes a vow, um, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. So again, more about their temple services being a travesty. Now, in the handout... Um, in, in uh, question one, what is uh, the author of the final book of the Old Testament? What does his name mean? This means my messenger. Question two, the answer is Lord of hosts or Jehovah because it's often, because God is always saying who's speaking. This is me, the Lord of hosts. Um, the answer to question three is really in question six. But yes, it was definitely there. We know that Zechariah was killed between the temple and the altar. And that was 95 years before this. So there was definitely a temple there, and, and so it was there. Jesus uh, referred to that in Matthew 23, where he said, On this generation is going is to come the blood of all the righteous, from Abel to Zechariah the son of Berechiah. And, and that's another reason why I don't think Malachi is a personal name. Uh, it would be unusual for somebody to name their child my messenger unless he was going to be your servant boy forever. Most of these Hebrew names were some praise of God, like, um, you know, um, Eli. We have, uh, uh, I'll just name one. Now I'm just, it's not like I can't name a prophet, but just looking at the minor prophet, Amos means loaded down with a burden. Zechariah means remembered by God. Um, Obadiah means servant of God. Hosea is God saves. You get the, the, the message. David is a little unusual, but that means beloved. If you pronounce it a little differently, same letters. But my messenger would be a peculiar name. Nobody's ever had that name. Um, I think that uh, also the fact that when Jesus talked about the righteous, that were killed from Abel to Zechariah. Zechariah being placed last in the only named, last named book would make sense. The first named person, Abel, was righteous. He died. The last named person in the Old Testament died, was murdered. From beginning to end, they murdered the righteous. And, uh, and so I think there's a, a pattern there. 
Um, chapter 2, and now, O priests, this commandment is for you, if you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not take it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your faces and the refuse of your solemn feasts, and one will take you away with it. Then you shall know that I have been sent, I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. So he's rebuking them so that, you know, he wants the covenant to continue. My covenant was with him of life and peace. I gave it to him that he might fear me. So he feared me, and he was revered before my name. Now, this is referring to Numbers 25. Um, in Exodus 19, God had intended that all his people would be a kingdom of priests, right? Well, what did they do within a few days? They built calf idols. So that promise was, was withdrawn. Later on in Numbers 25, uh, I'm going to read this. Now when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her body, so that the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel, because he was zealous with my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore, say, behold, I give him my covenant of peace. You see, the, the priesthood was now restricted to Levi because of what Phinehas did. So God had disowned his people from being a kingdom of priests, but then through this act, a priesthood was restored through this one man. Back to Malachi chapter 2. The law of truth was in his mouth and, and injustice was not found on his lips. This is again talking about Phineas. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned away and turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge. The people should seek the law from his mouth. Now, in Leviticus chapter 10, we have Nadab and Abihu being killed for strange, actually, uh, unclean fire. And so, the Lord spoke to Aaron directly, not to Moses this time and said, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the temple tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that you may distinguish between holy and unholy, and between clean and unclean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes with which the Lord had spoken to them by the hand of Moses. They were appointed here to be the teachers of Israel. They weren't to drink before they served in the temple because it's probably what got Adab, Nadab and Abihu killed. They could not distinguish unclean from clean because of that. Anyhow, there's always been problems with the priesthood too. It's, but the priests are called, for the lips of the priest should keep knowledge and the people should seek the law from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people, because you have not kept my ways, but you have shown partiality in the law. Now we're getting to the... Now he's done chewing out the priests. Now we're going to get to the people. Um, and, this, and it's this section here, 2.10 through uh, the rest of the chapter, it's similar to the last chapter of Ezra and this last chapter of Zechariah. They messed up marriage, really messed it up. And, uh, you know, they just, they did not get back on their feet like they should have. 
Um, have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do you deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in the land of Israel and Judah. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy instruction, which he loves. He has married the daughters of foreign gods. So Ezra and Nehemiah directly state this. They made the people who had done so put away those wives. Furthermore, Zechariah, uh, Nehemiah named them. He wrote a big long list of the priests who had done this. It was full exposure. They were rebuked publicly. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, being awake and aware, and who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. So these marriages with foreign women had to stop. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor will receive it with goodwill from your hands. Again, disingenuous crying and tears. They were hoping that that would appeal to God, but he's looking at what they're doing. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. This is the second offense. They were divorcing their Israelite first wives, the wives from their youth that they were supposed to keep, and they were trading them in for foreign women. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant, but did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Quickly jump to question four here. Malachi refers to the leaders of the land as governor. Uh, what Bible character had also served as governor during the Persian reign? Well, that would be Zerubbabel. Uh, when Haggai and, uh, and uh, Zechariah were sent to aid Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest, uh, Zerubbabel was called governor. Uh, there were 127 provinces in the Persian Empire. Each one had a governor. Okay? Israel had its governor. Even that guy, uh, Tatanai, uh, who, who opposed the children of Israel, he was a governor, but he was a governor outside the, on, the other, on the east of the Jordan River. Um, <clears throat> What sinful issues are addressed by both Malachi and Nehemiah in the following passages? Well, bad religion, incompetent priests, and marital sin. And you can throw Ezra in there, too. He dealt with that, too. Um, <clears throat> you have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, In what way have we wearied him? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them, or where is the God of justice? I think in this is what they're saying here is it's somewhat of a, uh, it's similar to what's said in other books that look how, look how the evil are prosper. You know, why is that? And, there's, and, they're, and what they're doing is mocking God in a way by saying, well, if you do evil, you prosper. You know, that's what they're saying. And they're saying, where is the God of justice? We don't see justice. Um, okay, chapter 3. <clears throat> Behold, I send my messenger. Again, that's Malachi. So it's, he's not sending the writer of the book. I, will, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple even the messenger of the covenant. Now the word messenger here is Jesus. You see, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into His temple. Because his first messenger prepared His way. And so then He was able to come suddenly in the temple. In John 2.13, Jesus was baptized, and He went to a Canaan for a wedding feast. By that time He had four disciples, Philip, Nathaniel, Andrew, and Peter. And then he went into the temple, and he cleared it out. He also did it in the last week of his life. So the first week of his ministry, he cleared out the temple. And the last week of his ministry, he cleared out the temple. 
So he's kind of, his ministry is bracketed with uh, zeal for his father's house. So the messenger of the covenant to whom you delight, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So this shows two persons in the Trinity right there, doesn't it? But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering of righteousness. This is similar to something that um, John the Baptist said of Jesus in, in Matthew 3. Um, So John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge the, his threshing floor and gather the wheat, his good people, into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So, so we, uh, let's see, I don't want to fall short of time. We have 10 minutes. Um, Question 7, how does Malachi describe the Lord in Malachi 3.6? Well, I am the Lord, I do not change. Um, what does the Lord call upon the people to do in Malachi 3.7? He tells them to turn to me and I will return to you. You know, repent. If, you, if we repent, he will turn to us too. But he has to turn away from us if we're misbehaving. So... Uh, I want to jump ahead a little bit. Uh, I don't want to speed read just to get through this, but uh, God talks about how that He's you're robbing Him. You're robbing Him when you don't give properly the right things that He asks for. Okay, and that's essentially what's going on there. And going down to verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. This is a highlightable verse. So a book of remembrance was written before him, and those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his word. So this book of remembrance, I'm not saying it's literally a God wrote a book, but for our understanding, when you write something down in a book, it, it, you keep it. It doesn't get lost. It, in ancient kings' libraries, um, you know, these things were big deals. Everything was chronicled every day in the library of an ancient king. All kings did that. And these were their chronicles. So it's God is the king of kings. And so it's only sensible that he has books. But there's only one book of life. So those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. The Lord listened and heard them. What does this say about God? Who does He hear? You know, people always ask, does God hear sinners? I'm not going to say no. But I do know He listens to those who fear Him and listen to His Word. He does hear them. And so I want God to hear me when I need it. If I call out in a bad thing, I, I want to know that He's going to hear and there's a lot of comfort in knowing that he will respond if you're ready. Um, they shall be mine, those who fear the Lord, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Chapter 4. I love this chapter. It's... Um, it's so perfect for the last book. Now, we've already talked about John the Baptist in chapter 3, verse 1. He's going to be brought up again. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like a stall-fed calf. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. 
Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. That is an amazing ending. Um, you know, the New Testament letters, we're used to nice, happy endings, you know, with blessings and things. The Old Testament prophets didn't really write like that. Um, they either concluded abruptly, or let me read the last verse of Isaiah. And they go, shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men whom have transgressed against me. For their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. The end. That, that's Isaiah's way of ending a book. Because Scripture is serious. All these prophets, they're, they're, if you, to sum it up, is just trying to correct us from going wrong and telling us about the, zoom, the doom that's going to happen if we don't change. This is a serious book. There's nothing in it that's light. And, and we, sadly, the, the picture that's painted here is even God's people, for the most part, failed. To the point where they murdered the righteous. It's not a good painting of, of humanity at all. But it seems to be the way it, it is. Um, now, the coming day of the Lord, the great and dreadful day of the Lord, Elijah would come. Um, and in Joel, the things that P Peter quoted that because the day of Pentecost was something and its attendant circumstances that would come before the great and dreadful year of the, uh, day of the Lord. Anybody who thinks they're a Jew today is going to have to answer, why was the temple destroyed and the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and the Messiah didn't come yet. I mean, who was it? The Messiah came, who was it? They're going to have to... The only option is Jesus, the Christ. Because unless these, they're going to say, oh, these prophecies are no good anymore, which a lot of them do, AD 70 was it for Israel, the physical Israel. So everything prophesied had to occur before then, the coming of the Spirit and everything. So, uh, anyhow, in Matthew 3, I wanted to look at something here. What was it? Um, Matthew 11, 14, there's confirmation there in, in one other place where, in fact, John is the, the, the Elijah. Jesus said, and if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He was talking about, oh, excuse me, for all the prophets and, and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. And then... Uh, Later on in Matthew uh, 18 or something like that, um, 17 somewhere, uh, it says that the, uh, let me see if I can cut this down, 17 it is. Oh yeah, uh, so Elijah truly, Jesus answered them because they asked, why do the scribes say Elijah must come first? Well, G Jesus said, Elijah truly is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has already come. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke of them of John the Baptist. Now this is an example of when the disciples made a good, said something smart. You know, a lot of times they said something kind of dumb because they weren't inspired. You know, here they, they, it shows they were thinking quite hard. And uh, they, I, I wouldn't have guessed that. So that was pretty good. But maybe they were thinking of Matthew 11 where it was kind of hinted at already. Um, let's see. Uh, question 10. The first three chapters of Malachi are written in debate style with questions and propositions set forth by God followed by the object of his, objections of His people. In, his, in, his, in this work, the people seemingly interrupt God's purpose and plans with their own objections to his affirmations. Uh, Josh has a nice list here of uh, you say and the Lord's response. Um, they did that 10 times, 10 times. It's kind of like, do you remember uh, in the children of Israel uh, and, and Moses and the Lord are dialoguing and he says to Moses, they have tried me 10 times. So again, there's, there's these numbers 
are supposed to make you remember something else. Um, what does Malachi say, or who does Malachi say would be sent before the coming of the Lord? Uh, we did look at that. And this person did, John the Baptist, prepare the way of the Lord, and then he, he went his course. They murdered him too. <laughs> Everybody knew he was a prophet, and they still murdered him. It's just crazy. It, it, you know, it's, it's... You know, secular people have a very high estimation of humanity. You know, we can do everything ourselves. We can be our own gods. We can solve all our problems... And people who are religious are foolish. And yet, it's only by the grace of God that the world is here at all. Evil people will run it into the ground and destroy everything given a chance. And so the day of the Lord, the days, days of the Lord, when He's moved against nations, have happened many times in human history. When, when it gets to a point where there's no remedy, the plug is pulled on that nation or city. And sometimes it's a global event. Remember in the days of Noah, that was it. All those people, and only Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And um, those percentages are a little dismal. They're depressing. It's one of the most depressing things in the Word of God is how few people are going to be saved. You know, it's just it's shocking because, you know, you kind of feel like, oh, there's a lot of good people, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of bad, but there's a lot of good. According to the Lord, it's not that way. And so we want to strive to enter that narrow gate and stay on that way. We have to do that because we don't have a good track record as a people. It's very bad. And so we don't want to be... Uh, have this type of letter written to us about, in general, about how we behave. Uh, their religious worship was a, was a mockery. Their families and their marriages were corrupted. And other than uh, not going back into Baal worship, they didn't do anything right. So, and it didn't, and it wasn't long from the captivity. I guess this would have been the second generation, maybe the third generation since they left Babylon. But uh, we know when the people left Egypt, which is a parallel, two generations, the one that outlived Moses and Joshua's generation, that was it, third generation, downhill. So we got to be real cautious. I think God's word at the bottom line is that we can't let our guard down. We, we really have to look out for ourselves and each other so that we can make it and, and keep fearing the Lord because He'll hear us. And fearing the Lord is so important because as 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, you know, the fear of the Lord will keep you from sinning. You know, the threat of what the, our Father in Heaven is going to do will keep us from doing stupid things. And we need that. We don't want to forget our fear of the Lord. Yes, we love Him with our body mind, soul, and heart, but we got to fear Him too. 